Hello and welcome to the small business briefing and we are back to uh, the Thursday edition. You know, we took a break off from doing Thursdays just once a week during the uh, summer months, but uh, things are really heating up. And so we're back to the two days a week format. My name is Brian Kelly and I'm the CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Hi everyone, welcome to our first Thursday show in a while. I'm Sarah Miller, Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Uh, I do wanna say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Marana Group. They are a data document and distribution company located in Kalamazoo. So let's dive into today's topics and let's start with the Federal Reserve. Uh, we continue to see the Federal Reserve uh, take action to tame inflation um, and recently, Fortune shared some details on the logic behind the actions and impact. Yeah, I thought it would be nice to share. Sometimes you kind of take for granted, you know, as the Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates, what does that really mean? Um, why are they doing it? Um, you know, and, the, and there's, you know, the impact on the housing market, but more broadly. Uh, and, and it would make sense to maybe uh, to, to talk through that, especially since it really looks like they're not yet done. We have seen uh, over the um, over the past few weeks uh, expectations set by the Federal Reserve and generally within the marketplace that uh, that there would be additional su substantial interest rate increases uh, to come here in the future, and um, and those would be uh, at the 50 basis points or half a percent or 75 basis point. Um, uh scale and that's big and and talking about two or three of those to come in the future and that has a lot to do with the concern uh, over um over inflation so i want to share with you just kind of a um, it's actually in tweet format that uh a, a, of an article that I, I really liked that fortune did to kind of walk through this in in a way that i thought was uh concise and and uh and, and very understandable compared to say an economist's uh, you know dissertation on the on the subject but um but as we we look through it i i thought it would be important to set a context you know because when you hear something like you know during the summer months we saw inflation you know rising costs compared to the same month 12 uh 12 months earlier um up uh, costs up over eight percent and what does that really mean i mean eight percent that we know that was that's a lot it's is more than it had been in 40 years. But when you boil it down and you think about what does that mean for the average family, uh, the if you consider that you know 100 percent of your income earned over the course of 12 months, what's the average amount of your income earned in any individual month? What percentage? Well, it's 8.33 percent of your income is earned each month. And so uh, the in the inflation. You know, why is the Federal Reserve so concerned about this? Why is the uh, the action so aggressive? Well, it's because already, uh, when we look at inflation, especially at the level that it, that it was in the in the summer, that it, it's the equivalency of taking uh, the the purchasing power taking away uh, a month's worth of pay, and uh, that's what eight percent inflation functionally means to people. And so it's a big deal and something that has to be uh, pretty aggressively dealt with. So I'm gonna share, and that is a little bit unconventional, but I decided to go ahead and rather than share the article than to share the actual uh, tweets, which kind of break down the article in, uh, into different um, bite-sized pieces here. So, um, so clearly starting out here with uh, the article, and here it is if you wanna take, a, um, to, to take a, a look at it yourself, but we have, entered a period where we're in a housing, um, what we'd, we'd call really a housing recession or a housing downturn. That's different than an overall economic recession. But um, but so the question, why? And it really, it's by design. It's part of the strategy, the Federal Reserve's strategy uh, to deal with inflation through rising interest rates and their target rate. Instead of 8%, they'd rather see inflation around 2%, which means you've got growth, but it's not the type of growth that eats into purchasing power substantially. And um, so they put together this kind of uh, the Fed's inflation plating playbook in six steps. So the central bank first increases um, the, uh, the, the interest rates, which filters into the, uh, into the mortgage rates. And we've seen substantial increases in mortgage rates. 
that causes home sales to, to, slink, to, to sink. You see existing home inventories go up. Clearly that is happening now. So days on market, number of houses on the market uh, increasing. Still, what would historically not be considered um, uh, bad in terms of days on market, but definitely trending longer. So we see that kind of slump starting. Um, home builders beginning to uh, to cut back demand for um, commodities going down as a result of that. And then of course, demand uh, that's so ingrained into so many different areas in the economy that you see demand across the economy as a whole fall some. And then when you see the economy fall, that's what uh, that uh, tames inflation. It brings inflation down. So um, the this third, you know, each of them are numbered. So they're third in this string. Um, it shows how quickly the housing activity is now contracting. New home sales down almost 30%. Existing home sales down 20%. Single family housing starts are down 18.5%. So home sales and home starts and then mortgage purchase applications. So mortgages to buy a new home uh, down 23%. These are really sharp uh, overall declines. So this first step in the process is clearly um, impacting things in terms of raising interest rates. Now, um, to give an idea of what that actually means to an individual, there's just a, a nice example, although it's, um, it's, a, it's a big number, but at the beginning of the year, uh, mortgage rates were around 3% and now they're over 6%. And uh, so if on a, on a, on a $500,000 mortgage, which is a big mortgage, I'm from a little town called Portland between Lansing and Grand Rapids, 500 does buys, well, I don't know, it used to buy a lot of house. The, uh, but anyway, a $500,000 mortgage, um, there is a, um, a difference of between eight and $900 a month based on the interest rate on that mortgage. And so that's a pretty big, uh, and over um, uh, amortized over 30 years, it's a really big difference in the overall payment. So think about in terms of demand for housing and housing at each price point being diminished because uh, the interest rate is about twice as much as it was before. So, um, so that naturally, look at uh, number five up here in the upper right-hand corner, that um, that when you put the higher interest rates together with the fact that housing prices during the pandemic jumped 43%, then it means that housing is, is much less affordable for both reasons. The prices jump so much and the interest rates are higher. And then, um, and so GDP, uh, housing GDP will fall projected to be 8.9%, fall 8.9% uh, in 2022. And, um, and then uh, projected to, according to Goldman Sachs, uh, drop even more in 2023. And so the, now that's different than overall GDP. Housing GDP, is, but, but this would be the earliest thing that you would see um, happen in, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the decline or substantial decline. And, um, now, if you're a buyer, you're not gonna see much relief here for a while, although you would expect that prices will come down some, the interest rates will continue, likely continue to rise for a bit longer, and who knows how long they'll stay. Uh, so in theory, the um, a weakened labor market coupled with, um, with falling inflation would lead, would lead to uh, the Fed, um, not just stopping the increase, but then to start lowering the interest rates again. And, um, and ultimately, they're going to be looking not just for what's happening in the real estate market. That is not enough for them to stop the monetary policy. What they're looking for is uh, wage inflation not to be so high, because that's the real driver in the economy of the overall uh, inflation. So um, if the um, essentially as long as, um, as inflation and inflation driven by the labor market persists, then you're going to see the Federal Reserve continue to increase uh, interest rates. So I thought it would be a good um, kind of primer, short, concise primer on what's happening out there. And it really, you know, when, when people ask that question, like, well, is there, are we in, in recession right now? Um, well, I know there's kind of a debate on if it started yet, uh, just to, to be clear that the, 
the tool in the toolbox to, to bring high inflation down is to cool off the economy and, and literally to, they're looking for, uh, to cause recessionary um, conditions in order to tame inflation. And the, the, the goal of it is to make sure that it's not too deep and not too long. So you get the best of both worlds. Uh, a contraction of the economy, uh, that's not that bad and inflation under control. Um, of course, what the, the risk is, is that um, the, the, maybe you get inflation under control, but then you cause a deep and a long recession and then you got a whole nother set of problems. So that's kind of the dance or the delicate um, step that the uh, Federal Reserve is currently taking. And um, they've sent plenty of signals that they are not done with this policy because they're seeing um, still a lot of wage inflation and are not convinced that uh, we've seen the end of high inflation uh, whereas, you know, I think you really not only you have to see it come down from six to eight percent where it's been, uh, but you're going to have to see it come down substantially, maybe half of that uh, before you see them easing up on the monetary policies of increasing interest rates. Uh, you mentioned wage inflation, and I think that takes us to another story out of California um, where a fast food council was established that will set and establish wages and benefits, which is pretty aggressive action. It really is aggressive action. And, and so, you know, if you think about the, um, like one of our, with, if inflation really is the biggest threat to the economy and, our, and the Federal Reserve clearly believes that the risk of inflation is greater than the, um, or the harms of inflation are greater than the potential risks of, um, of recession, the, um, it, it does make the California action look kind of out of step. But before we get to that, I wanted, I wanted um, to, to cover one more thing in terms of kind of in the, on the macro level. Um, like, is are the, federal, the, the federal policy to, um, to, or the Federal Reserve policy to increase interest rates, you know, how well is that working in terms of starting to cool off the economy um, and, um, and bring wage inflation uh, under control. Really the labor statistics that we're seeing now come out. So we just had a fresh uh, gr uh, uh, group of statistics come out late last week. And I think the answer is that it is start you're starting to see some impact. Now the, there, the, uh, the job growth was not anemic or anything over the last month. So the August numbers uh, that came out um, showed about 315, uh, job growth over the, the, the nation at 315,000 jobs. It was actually a little bit better than was uh, estimated. So the estimates were pretty pretty well on, on track, but they did, um, but they did, uh, they call, and by the way, that type of job growth, they call uh, kind of like Goldilocks job growth. So not too, not too hot, not too cold, just kind of, you know, middle or average. The, uh, but if you look at the previous months, there were downward revisions in those months. So when they talk about you know, the job growth each month and the unemployment rate, these are estimates based on surveys. And, um, and so when the, when the new estimates came out for August, they went back all the way to June and July and they did downward revisions. What they said was, you know, when we estimated those, there's a range and they picked where they thought it was in the range, but based on more data coming out successive months, they said, you know what? The range that we estimated there should have been lower. So we saw a downward revision for June, which is the second month in a row they've done that. And um, very, very rarely do you see downward, consistent downward revisions in previous months when you're not kind of uh, in, a, in a more anemic or, um, or a downward overall market. So, um, so this really, I think, is an indication that the Federal Reserve's um, policies to, uh, to, to try to cool off overall inflation, which includes wage, wage inflation, that it is starting to have an imp to make an impact. And uh, that's not to say I don't think they're gonna continue to, um, to raise interest rates, they're going to, I think at least a few more times, but, um, but there are signs that are showing up that, um, that I, I think are probably um, like a light at the end of the tunnel for easing of the monetary policies that, uh, that we're under right now. But that's what makes the actions that were taken in California that much more um, kind of bewildering, which is that 
they're looking at, uh, they have created now, and this isn't just a proposal, it was literally signed into law, a council of 10 people appointed by the state government there. And that council is uh, to determine wages and benefits of fast food uh, restaurant workers. And um, how they define who's fast food and who's not fast food, I think is, you know, that even that is kind of, you know, an interesting um, conundrum. It's not uh, maybe so easily uh, defined, but there's a, um, but they have uh, in five representatives of employers and five representatives of, of employees and they negotiate and set wages and benefits for the industry. Very um, aggressive type action. And you know, it's not unusual for California to move earlier, but this is a precursor. And we see it in a lot of different policy areas where something will happen in one state and, and it will start kind of a, a movement across other states where um, there, there'll be, there's an effort to try to um, where there's an effort to try to get these policies um, in place in other in other states, so we pay pretty close attention to what's happening around the uh, around the country to try to to know the areas that we've got to be on defense with. And um, the idea of having a government wage and benefit council in any industry that essentially establishes the um, the rules inside of businesses. Uh, would would really be a, a big threat to our competitiveness, and uh, is that we've got a long-standing history of believing that small business owners themselves ought to decide what packages they want to offer, and um, if it's good enough to attract employees, it will, and if it's not, it won't. And uh, and and having government intervention at uh, at that or really any level is um, is uh, against the policies that we fight for, trusting in small business owners in the marketplace to. Uh, to uh, to come up with the with the best outcomes, so um, we'll keep an eye on on the ramifications of the um, of that uh, policy that is passed there, and uh, but more importantly, uh, be on guard for it here. All right, let's talk about some news here in Michigan. There are some new poll numbers out for the uh, governor's race. Yeah, new poll numbers, and and they're actually I think largely consistent with other polls that have come out. So obviously the top of the ticket being um, the governor's uh, the governor's race, and that's the, the part that got the most attention. It had uh, Governor Whitmer at 48% and uh, in challenger uh, Tudor Dixon at, um, at 35%. Um, there have been other polls that, uh, that show uh, Governor Whitmer somewhere between, you know, anywhere between 48 and 51%. It's actually been very consistent in that type of a range. And then um, the, the range in terms of, uh, of uh, Tudor Dixon has been very wide from in the 30s up uh, to, to about uh, 46, I think is a high watermark that I've seen. Uh, this most recent poll though, mid 30s. And I think what you're seeing there, it might on the surface seem very inconsistent, but I think what you're seeing there is that uh, Tudor Dixon still has very low name ID. So, um, normal kind of Republican voters, the ones that would, nor, all they got to do is know the name of the person and then um, that's who they vote for. And there are plenty of Democrats that vote for the Democrat, a lot of Republicans that just vote for the Republican. Um, that that uh, the range in, in Tudor Dixon's numbers can probably be explained by the fact that uh, she's brand new on the scene and a lot of people don't know her name yet. But the, um, but clearly, um, whether the the margin is five or ten or thirteen percent, um, you know, Governor Whitmer is starts out in a pretty commanding position, uh, being at uh, you know between forty eight and fifty one percent. Obviously, fifty one percent is enough in, under any circumstances to win um, an election. And so, uh, for her, she's going to be trying to uh, to to maintain what she has and kind of incrementally build. Uh, Tudor Dixon is need, is going to need to see some big moves in a relatively short period of time to get into this thing. And what could we learn from the recently filed campaign finance reports? The campaign finance reports um, really confirmed what I think a lot of people um, you know, believed, what, uh, believed was happening and, and also consistent with the pre-primary uh, campaign finance statements, which show that Governor Whitmer is in a huge, huge money lead. So, 
um, cash on hand at 14 million and uh, Challenger Tudor Dixon at uh, 523,000. So, I mean, that's a, that, that's a really, really big gap to try to make up. And, you know, the election is just a few months away here. So it's, um, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a big gap. And while money isn't everything, you do have to be able to get your message out there and on TV um, and, uh, you know, on, on the internet and on the radio and mail in the mailbox and all that stuff costs a lot of money. I can tell you from personal experience, it's really, really expensive to run. For governor and that is um and so that that's becoming a big part of the story it's just the gap in the financing between the two uh between the two candidates but then it shows up in other ways too um just the number of fundraisers between the pre-primary -pri uh period and the post-primary campaign finance report 35 days governor whitmer did 26 according to mlive 26 different fundraisers and um and again according to mlive um, that uh, the Dixon campaign didn't do any during that time period. I was remember they were selecting a, a uh, lieutenant governor candidate and kind of going through that um, convention fight. And so um, just the, the, the amount of the, the gap in the financing is, um, is really, really big. It, it's get, the calendar is getting short to make that up. And then from a staffing standpoint too, this all feeds into it, right? So, um, the Whitmer campaign has a has a big campaign staff. Um, I read where it was upwards of about four dozen people, 48, 49 people, um, compared to just a few, um, you know, a handful on the on the Dixon campaign. There's a lot of work uh, to that it takes to run for governor. So, uh, but all this really, all of those disparities I talked about, it just ties back to though having the resources to tell the story, and so. Um, I think that's really uh, of all the stories out of this campaign so far. I think the the widening gap on financial resources is uh, probably the well, not probably it is the biggest obstacle uh, that the Dixon campaign will have in getting in this race and uh, narrowing the gap with Governor Whitmer, who's got to feel pretty good about the position that she's currently in. And of course, we'll make this a recurring update over the next. Uh two months or so until until the election. Um, it's a short week, so I think we're gonna have a little bit of a short show today, um, but we'll be back here Monday and Thursday for our new regularly scheduled programming. Uh, but before we say goodbye, I do wanna let you all know that we have a few events coming up. We will be in Marquette next week, September 13th for an owner to owner event. Brian, you'll be there along with um, some of our colleagues. And then we're also partnering with some of our strategic partners will be at Wake Up Keweenaw on September 14th, followed by a lunch and learn with the Greater Ishpeming Nagani Area Chamber of Commerce and the Lake Superior Community Partnership. Um, and again, that's on September 14th. So if you're in those areas, please join us for the owner to owner um, or uh, reach out if you'd like more information on those two uh, other events. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your week and we'll be back here on Monday. Thanks everybody, see you on Monday.